Welcome back, everyone. We are officially done with the four episode roundtable discussion on prayer. But now we want to get into a few long form interviews with our luminary thinkers of choice. Ladies and gentlemen, we have none other than Strawn on the other end of the line. Strawn, you do officially have a last name, Coleman, right? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Not so known for it, but Coleman it is. But when you have a name like Strawn, you know, it's like Sting or Bono or whatever. You're just in great company. You need nothing more. For those of you not familiar with my friend Strawn, he is an award-winning folk musician from, okay, help me. I've been there, and even after two weeks on the ground, I get the pronunciation wrong of where you are from. Help me as a hopeless American. Yeah, I live in a small beach town called Tairua. Yeah. There you just, go. Just a couple of hours south from Auckland, and which is our main city in the North Island. That's the North Island of New Zealand, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Strawn is also a poet and a writer. You have three beautiful little booklets out on prayer. And your first full-length book is out this month. It's called Beholding, Deepening Our Experience in God. It was my honor to read an early version and write a foreword for it. You are also the founder of Commoners Communion, where Strawn serves as a spiritual director, retreat leader, and also runs online prayer courses. And we can chat about that later for those interested in deepening their communion with God. So Strawn, welcome, my friend. Thank you, man. Kia ora. It's such a pleasure to be with you. I was trying to remember this morning what year it was that we met. Was it 2019, I think? Something like that. Oh man, it's a few, it was pre-COVID, which was like in my brain. It's all a blur. I know. Yeah, it feels like a decade ago. It does. Eh? And it feels like a lifetime. I was on a trip down to Auckland where I did an event called Formatio that was a conference on spiritual formation and it was a wonderful weekend. And then we did, and I met you in passing there. You did some kind of prayer liturgy stuff at the event. But then we were on that little pastor's retreat that was such a delight to my heart. And we got to, you know, spend a few unhurried days together. And I'm sure those of you listening have had that experience. It's only happened to me a few times in life where you just meet somebody and it's what my friend John Tyson would call a kindred spirit. You're just so quickly on the same page. And I think you and I just, I just still have such fond memories in my heart of those conversations because I think you know, we're all just stumbling our way through life and life with God. And it sounds like, you know, you and I have been coming from different places, but on a similar journey, just in yeah. uh, learning about some very common interests in Christian spirituality, whether that's contemplative prayer or what is the contemplative look like next to the charismatic or Eastern Orthodox theology or ancient Christian spirituality or mm -hmm. theology of the body or silence and Christian meditation. Just, I think a lot of those kind of, we're asking very similar questions. And yeah. so we just hit it off and I'm so happy to sit down with you. Not in person, mm -hmm. sadly, because we are on different <laughs> continents, but, uh, over the interweb. So, you know, you, Strawn, um, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on was not just because I enjoy your company, but you're in a list of a few people, Tyler Staten would be one other friend of mine, who just at a, you're an old soul in a youngish body, youngish, because you're not <laughs> that young, but younger, and you have such a real deep rich life of prayer. So maybe to start, and we don't need to spend 30 minutes on it, but just maybe start off with a little bit of autobiography. How did you come into the life of prayer that you have now? And I know none of us feel like we're good at prayer and that's not even the point. And hopefully we mature beyond that. I think of St. Teresa, you know, who said, we, we all have to return to the beginning. We're all beginners when it comes to prayer. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you're like, you know, Mr. Ninja advanced in prayer, but you do have a very real and genuine, you know, deep life with God that you carry around in the temple of your body. So how did you get there? Because I know it was not through just reading three books and following a certain formula. It was, you know, yeah. I think as for most of us through, through some pain. So talk to us about yeah. how you came into this work around prayer message, life message of prayer and experience of prayer. Yeah, cool. Well, firstly, man, just let me say, um, 
just such a pleasure to be here with you in this space and so honored to hang out and talk about the stuff that I love. And yeah, I do remember back then in 2019 or 2018 or in the pre-COVID world, whenever it was, it's just such a pleasure to meet somebody else. And I know what you're saying. It's like listening to you say those things was almost like, yeah, there's a really, it's like a Christian geeky niche kind of reaching back into (laughs) early church orthodoxy stuff and the present charismatic stuff that we so enjoy and trying to make sense of these kind of two floods. So it's just been such a pleasure getting to know you, man. And you've helped give so much language to, I think, not just myself, but so many of us and the experiences we're going through. So thanks for having me. Um, But yeah, my my own journey of prayer is kind of funny. I'm a strange mix. I, I, in my earliest years of prayer was really into kind of lots of intercessory prayer groups. And I kind of came through quite strongly in a Pentecostal environment. So it was sort of all night prayer meetings and all the fasting and the prayer and, you know, the big revival meetings, they're less common now, but you know, the Americans would come to New Zealand and the big stadiums and we'd go to those. And, and so for quite a number of years, I was really like, how old are you, Strong? 30 something? 37. 37. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is scary, man. Yeah, this is harkening back to my 20s, which used to feel like five years ago. Uh, and so I was kind of a friend of mine, and, and I were doing tons of intercessory prayer stuff almost as our full time vocation. And we were kind of traveling between intercessory prayer groups and home churches and kind of doing lots of sort of underground church or home church, whatever language you want to use, meetings, traveling, doing music and doing these records. And yet I just sort of hit this wall with my body and the doctors couldn't figure out what it was, but it just started to fall apart, became really sick. And so really out of like a couple of years, I would have spent 60, 70% of my time just in bed, unable to move, doing whatever. And during that time, in order to kind of give my kids some relief, I started sort of shipping myself off to this Franciscan retreat center. And for for those years, I just spent my time in silence and in quite intense solitude, just learning to exist and learning to exist with God. And I think what happened was I just had this huge recalibration of my understanding of what it meant to reach God or experience God and was kind of brought into this space. And And a few years later, when I started to emerge a little bit better and connect with people again, people would just say to me, oh, so you're a contemplative now. And I was a bit like, I didn't know what a contemplative was. So I was like, okay, what's that? And that sort of led me on this journey of of reading back into church history and finding this entire other language for what had been utterly foreign to me. Um, And I I think so the way that I came into that sort of contemplative space was through sort of naive experience. And I think that's why it's been such a good home for me. It wasn't so much of a mind journey as a, just a a relenting into the newness of God in my life. Yeah. It sounds like you were forced into it. I I often meditate on that story in the gospels where, you know, Mark writes that Jesus constrained the disciples to get into the boat. And the Greek word there is like almost forced them against their will. And uh, I don't know what your theology of suffering is. I'm most certainly not saying that, God made you chronically ill as a father and such. But there are times when I think the contemplative life searches us out. It's not us because we're so spiritual and we go out and we find it. It's, it's, it's searching us out. But uh, that had to have been so disorienting to go from a Pentecostal, charismatic, noisy kind of life of literally traveling the world as a prayer leader and recording artist to flat on your back, sick, unwell in a monastery. And it was a few years of your life, right? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was quite a number of years and yeah, it was hard. I mean, my whole premise, it was like, God is with me, his spirit's upon me. I'm going to go out and do the work of God. I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going to travel to places. I mean, when I did shows, I would like do shows in random. I mean, I did a show in like a martyred anarchist pirate bar in like deep rural Germany. (laughs) And, you know, I'm up there for like an hour and a half and I'm like preaching the gospel and sort of getting words for people and like saying, Hey man, I feel like God's got this word for you. And, you know, I'm living this like really sort of vibrant life. And I go from that to nothingness. And one of my biggest struggles was, God, how can you love me when I'm unable to do for you? Like what, how do I relate to you when I'm not 
working with you or working for you or progressing or these things. And I think, I think that that hard transition for me was moving from this sort of working relationship with God to a friendship, a sort of a being oriented um, communion with God that was really difficult for me. It's just not how I was sort of wired. And um, it was a big change, but it was a, I kind of see it as this magnificent invitation from God. Um, and maybe the sickness gave brevity to that, but it was sort of inviting me to say yes to a different way. And I'm, I'm really grateful for it. But yeah, it was, it was a lot of pain in those years and a lot of strife yeah. and anxiety and disappointment. Yeah. Yeah. They say pain is the great teacher. And, you know, sadly, I don't think I've quite figured out how to be led into the depths with God without pain and circumstances that are out of my control and against my will and better judgment. Um, yeah. But there's something, whatever the source is, you know, and most of the time I don't think it's God at all, but whatever the source of our pain is, it's often the, the portal, the open door into a deeper life with God. Now, I think one of the things that you and I have kind of bonded over is at 30,000 feet, this idea of the contemplative charismatic, uh, which is, I don't know who coined that phrase, if it was you or me or likely neither of us. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think you came up in the Pentecostal charismatic tradition. I did not. Um, I came up in a more kind of Bible church tradition, but then came into the charismatic tradition uh, and had a wonderful experience with it. Uh, kind of learning about the things of the spirit, in particular through kind of the Anglican charismatic movement in the UK. Yeah, wow. But, uh, and so at a theological level, 110% in, at an experiential level, you know, life changing for me. But at a personality level, I've always felt like the odd man out. Like I have this working theory where different church traditions, you could give like a different Myers-Briggs type, you know? And oh, I think yeah. my Myers-Briggs type is like old school Presbyterian, you know, <laughs> not, uh, not charismatic, you know, and not even necessarily contemplative, but, um, but the charismatic tradition, you know, for those of you familiar with Myers-Briggs, I think I would give it ESFP. That's how I would go. And, uh, and that's not to discount any tradition. It's just to say there are certain personality types that I think gravitate toward different streams of the church. And I think that's a beautiful yeah. thing. It's not a critique. It's yeah. just an observation. But I've always felt a little out because theologic, by theology, I'm a charismatic, but by personality, I'm most definitely not. I'm not an extrovert. I'm not loud. I'm not action oriented. I really struggle to commune with God in crowds worship by singing. I believe in theologically, but it's a kind of uphill discipline for me. So mm -hmm. the contemplative world is just where I find so much life with God and silence and meditation and resting in him. But yet I really hold to and believe in the importance of the charismatic. So maybe would you just riff for me a little bit? Uh, what comes to mind for you when you think about the contemplative charismatic? How would you define both of those worlds? Are they at odds with each other? Are they mm. two sides of the same coin? Are they two ends of a spectrum? Frame that mm. up for me. Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly no um, pro when it comes to this dynamic. Um, and it has been something that I've really tried to understand and, and understand the shape of in my life because, yeah, I've always been a little bit of an odd one out too, even in the kind of charismatic Pentecostal circles in my younger days. I was always maybe a little bit more quieter or maybe kind of accessing that sort of um, spirit or temperament in a different way too. Um, and I think that's a part of it. But I also think that part of our language around contemplative and charismatic is maybe a touch of prejudice or maybe a touch of that sort of like um, scientific approach to Christianity where we have to kind of categorize and explain everything and we kind of yeah. create these dichotomies that don't exist. And so, I mean, when I think of charismatic, what I think about is sort of accessing the experiential realm of Trinitarian life and God. So w when I think about if I, the charismatic part of me is the part that says, yes, absolutely. God can be experienced. He can heal people. He can prophesy today through the church. He can do the things that Jesus did then. And on top of that, have a vibrant felt, um, 
closeness with me. And so when I think of charismatic like that, contemplative is a perfect match because the contemplative life is really just a way of saying, I can access God, the Trinity, and be in union with him um, through things like solitude, solitude and silence as a practice. So maybe, maybe the contemplative and the charismatic are the same, at least in desire, but maybe they, they just differ in sort of energy spend. So um, what do I mean by that? I think of, when I think charismatic, I think external energy spend, you know, like hmm. I'm going to sing out, we're going to get in groups, we're going to, you know, the old language of Pentecostal language of tarrying with God. I don't know if anyone was around, you know, when I was coming through, it was like, we're going to tarry all night. And I don't even yes. know what it really means, but you know, they're, they're going hard after God and pressing in. And it's a lot of energy spend. And when I think of, when I think of the contemplative life, instead of pushing that energy outward, singing louder, gathering louder, pushing harder, it's more of a receding into the energy of God that abides within us. So it's almost seeking, it is seeking the same thing, but via a different, a different um, spend. And so the contemplative would say, God ab abides in me. I am abiding in Christ, therefore I'm abiding in Trinity. And as I ease into that, as I rest into that, out comes this abundant vitality, this life that then pours itself out to others. Um, and maybe the the kind of difference in how that manifests is really that a charismatic person is, is maybe more demonstrative or maybe when we think charismatic culture, we think demonstrative culture. Um, but in a contemplative nature, it's less demonstrative and so it looks less charismatic, but actually the heart is the same. So I think it's just a little bit about redefining what we mean by charismatic, what the goal of charisma is, um, and maybe exploring what the charismatic world can look like through the fruits of gentleness and peace and kindness and patience and stillness. And then how does it look on the other end of those fruits, if that makes sense? Yeah, would you say that the contemplative is a little bit more focused on the fruits of the spirit and the charismatic a little bit more on what most people would call the gifts or the manifestations of the spirit, prophecy, healing, the miraculous, faith, tongues, all of that, as opposed to love, joy, peace, patience. And of course, those two things are not remotely intention. They are yeah. designed to run together like a train track, you know? Yeah, it does It does seem that way. And I think, I think not because charismatic people say oh we value the gifts more than the fruit or that contemplatives would say we value the fruit more than the gifts but i think just naturally in our value systems things rise to the surface and we might emphasize one or the other yes um but maybe in the charismatic world i seek i seek love joy and peace as sort of a endowment of power from the spirit whereas in the contemplative world i might seek um love peace and joy through an inner welling up of the spirit within me. So it's almost like a different expectation of the way in which that fruit arrives. And so a contemplative might say, well, the gifts of the spirit will naturally manifest as I'm transformed into the likeness of Jesus um, through love, peace, and joy. Um, in the charismatic world, we might say the gifts of the spirit will come from a supernatural endowment or a download or an anointing or something like that. So in, in some ways, it's just a different sort of expectation, but they're both really two, they're both the same, same God, same desire, same manifestation. What, yeah. I, what I'm hearing, and, you know, I think when we talk about the contemplative charismatic, the, the point of overlap for me at a theological level is what I think we would call a theology of manifest presence. And some of this is frankly over my pay grade. I didn't go to a long enough seminary program <laughs> to give a great explanation. But all I know is that at the most basic level, there is nowhere God is not, call that omnipresence or whatever. And yet there are times and places when it's not just that I am more centered and grounded and aware and attuned to God. God seems to be manifesting or coming to me in a unique and special and intentional and deliberate way, whether that's in prayer or in a church experience, 
with worship by singing or in a deep conversation with a friend around a fire pit or the confession of sin to a spiritual director or whatever, there are moments of manifest presence. You know, I think of Willard, Dallas Willard, who most people don't know this, was an absolute charismatic but you would never really know unless if you read certain portions of his writing because he doesn't have any of the cultural trappings of a charismatic. He Exactly. He was quiet. He was an intellectual. He was a professor. He was thoughtful. But he spent, you know, I think the last 20 years of his life in a vineyard church just north of L.A. His book, uh, Hearing God's Voice, is thoroughly charismatic in theology. He has a whole chapter where he writes, quote, Jesus will walk up to you in prayer and talk to you. Mm. Now, no good cessationist would, they would write books against that statement, you know? (laughs) And he has this very biblical, very thoughtful kind of exploration of that. And when I read like, you know, the word contemplative means different things to different teachers and writers at different moments in church history. But when I read some of the modern kind of contemplative writers, they don't have a theology of manifest presence. I mean, some of it is virtually indistinguishable from Buddhism. It's about breathing. It's about detachment. There's no theology of intercession. Some would say full on you mature past asking God for things. And I I just Mm. find no way to square that with the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. Mm. And it's just breathing and detachment and awareness and surrender And so, you know, the famous kind of modern contemplative line, you know, what's missing is awareness. So the idea is that, you know, God is all around us and just we're not the ones, we're the ones who are not present. And of course, there's tons of truth in that. I think I'm missing God 23 hours of the day, you know, Mm. um, because I'm not aware. But yet I still just at an experiential level and then at a biblical level and for sure at a historical level, there seems to me to be moments where Jesus will walk up to you and talk with you. And so that's what I love about the contemplative charismatic. If on one end of the charismatic tradition, you have just all extroverted noise and activity Mm. and very, and you know, life with God is something you do and you are chasing after miracles. And on the other end, you have quasi Buddhist Christian detachment with no manifest present. There, there's some beautiful blending where both uh, the person in a crowd of thousands of people singing to Jesus and praying for miracles and the person quietly alone early in the morning with a cup of tea just trying to yield a deeper part of their heart to the Trinity, mm. they're both experiencing mm. some version of manifest presence. How, how, mm. how would you interact with that? Agree, disagree? Riff on that. Yeah, I love that, man. I've, I've been thinking a lot recently about... Um, You know, the kind of seeker-friendly church model that was really big when I was sort of coming up in my church growing up and the idea being, you know, essentially to make the church environment welcoming to people who who aren't ready for church yet, which I think has got amazing strengths and amazing challenges, you know, as I think we discovered over the time. And I do think that there is sort of like a seeker-friendly contemplativeness or a seeker-friendly quote-unquote mysticism, which really almost depersonalizes God and makes it so similar to mindfulness and meditation that you have this kind of force or essence or being that you're trying to engage with that isn't really the dynamic and interpersonal and exciting God that we discover in Christ and in in the scriptures. And I think there's a real danger that in the contemplative tradition that we do just make God some kind of energy or some kind of feeling or some kind of possessiveness um or the absence the of charis- feeling or the ill or the absence of feeling and what i love about my charismaticness if i can if that's a word is the way it personalizes god and i think that in prayer true prayer comes from personalizing god as much as we can in the human sense of dialoguing with him about emotions and feelings and his emotions and feelings and so i i found for me at least you know spent these years four or so years in these intense intercessory groups. Now I still intercede and pray and I, and I kind of, my background is more in those prophetic communities and I still long for those that for God to speak. I think it's just the way that I expect him to, to arrive in those moments or the expansion of what it means for him to arise in those moments that's changed. Um, so it's more like, yeah, God might speak very quietly in the stillness of my heart, 
or he might still come to me in a dream or a vision or it actually may be a meditation upon something in nature that reveals something of his character that then becomes something to be shared and so i think it's more expanding what we mean when we say something like god speaks or the spirit arrived or god manifested that i think tradition offers us than it is removing that manifest presence and i think the thing is we all have a danger don't we in every season to err towards one or the other um I can be more charismatic sometimes and contemplative and I feel that tension of like, whoa, I've just got to recede or man, I've got to pull myself out. Um, we run into danger when we make God a program or a system or an ism or an ology. Or a personality preference, don't you think? Yeah, or a personality preference. And then we say, oh, I've got it now. I'm a dot, dot, dot contemplative or Pentecostal or charismatic. Um, and I think the second we do that. Or whatever, yeah. Yeah, whatever. The second we do that, I understand why we do, because it, 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 but really it's a system of control. And what it does is we get trapped in that ism or that ology. And then God loses his personhood. And then prayer becomes less dynamic. And I want to always push back against that. Yeah, you know, it's the danger of personality preference based spirituality. Like we all, we, we, we come into the church through some kind of an entry point. And so you might come into a Pentecostal tradition because your parents were Pentecostals or because your coworker was and he or she invited you to church and you became a Christian. And so that's your first church experience. And it may be a wonderful fit for your personality or it may be a terrible fit for your personality, but all of us have personality preferences. You know, we're either extroverted, we draw energy from being around people or we're introverted like me, we're loud and outgoing or we're shy. I mean, we're, you know, more structured or we're more spontaneous and those aren't good or bad. They Mm -hmm. just are. And we definitely don't want to moralize them. And I think many of us start our spiritual journeys with a discipleship that is very conducive to our personality structure. So, you know, Gary Thomas has that whole idea of sacred pathways and that's the beginning point for the spiritual journey. But we have to mature beyond our personality preferences in order to become people of love and in order to get out of our little niche in the negative sense, our tiny little sliver of the kingdom of God, because the kingdom is so much bigger. And, you know, I just always think about it through like the lens of my wife and I. So um, on the Myers-Briggs, I'm a high J, she's a high P. If you have no clue what that means, uh, I'm a high like structure, planner, organize, plan out everything kind of person. She has rarely planned out anything in her entire life. She is adaptable, flexible, go with the flow, relaxed. And uh, I have a more control oriented personality. She has a more chaos oriented personality. And so maturity for us is literally moving in the opposite direction. If the telos of the spiritual journey is to become more loving in Christ, then my uh, emphasis on control and structure and 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 discipline can actually um, can actually block love. You know, for example, when my kids interrupt me and it's like, no, this is my rule of life. Says this morning from seven to eight, I am praying. Don't interrupt me. You know, that's clearly not that's that's not working. My wife, on the other hand, is the opposite. She has to become more disciplined and thoughtful and organized and follow through in order to love well. So both of us have to mature beyond our personality Mm. preferences in order to both experience God and become like God. So I think that's the danger with I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm drawn to this, I'm drawn to that. There's a rightness into that, especially as the spirit of God is stirring in us to move in a certain tradition or direction, but we, we can't Mm. stay there. I think we have to keep Mm. moving. And, you know, when I think about where we're moving to, would you, would you talk to us, Strong, just about, you know, this ancient Christian language still used in, in the Eastern church, but of union with God or union with the Trinity or even union with the Trinity within. Would you talk to us about like what ancient Christians mean by that word and, and how does that dovetail into this conversation? Yeah, well, I mean, um, be careful not to presume to speak for ancient Christians because as much as I'd love to consider myself a you know, scholar of the early church. Um, but, I mean, and this for me, again, is where this is the simplicity. I mean, we've, what we talk about, charismatic, contemplative, it's almost the complexity, personalities, all of this stuff when we get to the, the fringes of understanding it. But the foundation of prayer, the foundation of really the gospel is this. 
by some unbelievable mystery and wonder and grace. We have been caught up into the Trinity through Jesus Christ. He has invited us into the community of capital L love, you know, the the capital R reality, the this divine dance, this this almost impossible to imagine joyous celebration of personhood, we have been engulfed into that. And actually, if Jesus' words are anything to be, to be believed, and I, I fully believe they are, then they that has made its home. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit has made their home within us. Um, this is crazy. This should stop everybody in their absolute tracks. This is madness. I mean, we're talking about humans here, right? Like, I don't know about you, bro, but I don't wake up feeling like a very perfect person ever. Uh, and most of the days I put my head on the pillow and I think about, oh, I should have done that differently with my sons or whatever. And yet, in the midst of that imperfection and brokenness, th- the very God who created the cosmos, who could be and do and sit wherever he wants, has decided to live here. And I think that the, for me, this journey into union with God is a journey into really realizing how majestic that is and to stop being so casual about it. You know, we say it so casually, oh yeah, God lives in me. And it's like, man, think about that for a second. And so to me, prayer, I, I think hundred percent, the primary purpose of the gospel is to restore this intimacy with God that is like beyond anything we can imagine, that God sent Jesus to invite us into himself, and the primary purpose of prayer is to come into that reality at deeper and deeper levels, or another way of saying it is just to say yes to God. You know, Revelation 3.10, or is it 3.20, I can't remember. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. You know, he's the initiator. He's there saying, strong I want you. I want to live in you. I love living in you. My desire is to soak every cell up in your body with my love and presence. Will you say yes? And so the prayer for me has always primarily been yes. Come and soak me to the core. Awaken me to your love and let me be like you. And that out of that union, out of that place of God wants to be that my every minute, every second of the day sort of, um, experience comes this over the second yes, this overflow of yes to you arriving to the world through me to, to healing or to loving others. So, in that sense, prayer like it's for me. That's why you know back in 2017 when I started my work, it was I wanted to use the word communion because prayer conjures some kind of conscious mental dialogue, right? It's like I talk to God and He talks back, or I say things. Whereas communion is this in, embodied fully lived life experience, just seeing God and being seen by God when I'm doing the dishes, when I'm talking to my kids, it's living in an awareness that I am the home of the Trinity and seeking to understand that in deeper and deeper levels for the rest of my life. At least that's how I kind of, how I understand. And I I think I still treat the Trinity too casually. I I mean, to even talk like this is madness. I feel like we shouldn't even talk like this. This is crazy. I'm saying that God lives in me. And yet my my invitation, I think, is to continue continue to say yes to that mystery uh, the rest of my days. Yeah, the beauty of that. I feel like we should just have a moment of silence. Yeah. You know, thinking about that line in Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I, you know, I grew up hearing that used as an evangelistic mm. text, like aimed at non-Christians, like Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart, which is surely a, a beautiful word picture. But exegetically, you know, that's Jesus knocking on the door of a church that had mm. shut him out uh, to Christians, you know. And I love this idea of, you know, the body is the temple it's a doorway into our inner woman or man and Jesus there knocking mm-hmm. on the door, you know, like, let me come in and, and dine with you, feast with you, celebrate with you, mm-hmm. commune with you, you know. So you, you said something in passing that God is the initiator. I don't think most people think about prayer that way. I think most of us tend to think about prayer as something we do to, for, at, mm-hmm. with God, not as something that God does in and through mm-hmm us what would you say to that 
Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, there's so many ways to approach that. You look at the incarnation, um, creation. In every story, God is initiating his love and desire for a relationship with, with us. And so, and really, Trinity is always speaking. Father, Spirit, and Son, they're not some kind of static. They're not sitting around that kind of wondering what to do. I mean, they are always singing. He, you know, God is always singing songs of energy and life. And so when we, when we arrive consciously to prayer, we are simply sort of jumping in a moving river. We are saying, yes to the life of God. Can we participate in this divine dialogue that's always going on? And so, and because God is love, he is, he, love isn't just something he does. It's who he is. So, this love is always pouring itself out on creation. And Jesus kind of put it this way, the sun rises over the good and the evil. In other words, you know, my father's love is pouring out nonstop. It's, it's whether you'll receive it. And so prayer is simply about opening ourselves to God and starting by saying, yes, you've initiated desire for me. You've initiated a hunger to commune with me not because you're insecure or you need it, but because you're so secure you want it and desire it. And I'm going to say yes to that. Um, and the way that I've come to understand intercession and prophecy and all of those things is that sort of my intercession is my wading into that river. And then, you know, if we kind of imagine this image of like canoeing or, or you know, if we think about receiving God's love, sort of floating down a river, it's his river, his movement, his life, and we're just abiding in it. And I kind of see intercession as almost like you take your kayak. We call them kayaks in New Zealand. I think you might call them canoes there, whatever. We take our kayak or a canoe into the river, and we are, we are kind of navigating the eddies and the rocks and all of that, but it's still in the flow of the river. So intercession is still response but it's like a co-creativity. It's like, I'm going to move with you in your flow of love toward the world and participate in interceding and praying for and seeking for them. But it is still ultimately God's initiation that I'm responding to. And in that space, I still have an active co-laboring role. So yeah, for me, prayer, God initiates through his love, through his peace, his self-revelation, his giving. Um, and the beginnings of prayer is, the, is just the yes to that, saying, okay, I'm available. For the record, we have kayaks and canoes in oh, America, okay. <laughs> but they are two separate types of boats. I don't know if they're, they're not really boats, but whatever, they're different. Okay. So we have both. Okay. I don't know. I don't know what, if your kayak is our kayak or what, but, uh, you know, you said something fascinating that you chose the word communion over the word prayer because people think of prayer as a verbal, mental, in God's direction. You know, for the prayer practice, we use this kind of four-part frame of talking to God, talking with God, listening to God, and being with God. Mm -hmm. And that last one, I think, is the most foreign to a lot of us, in particular in the West, because we have such a prefrontal cortex kind of based approach to life and, and not just for Christians. I mean, our entire Western educational system is literally designed around what a growing number of scientists would call the myth of kind of this enlightenment Cartesian, you know, mind forward, prefrontal cortex forward mm. worldview, which becomes uh, a massive hindrance in spiritual formation because so much of our growth and maturity into Christ likeness does not actually happen through the will, the prefrontal cortex, our executive center, but mm -hmm. through our body, the automatic responses in our body, the memories that we carry in our body. Mm -hmm. So whatever prayer is, it, it has to come through the mind, but it has to also go beyond at some level, the mind, just meaning our directed attention. Yeah. So th th there's some type of prayer that goes beyond words. It doesn't replace them, but it goes beyond them and comes from I think a deeper part of us from our, and from our body itself. I mean, is that what you think, you know, people are getting at when they talk about like unceasing prayer, you know, whether that's from Paul or how do you think about that? I mean, if, if the end goal, you know, in eternity is union with the Trinity, the short term goal is, is to begin to walk into that union through Christ and by the spirit. But that has to go beyond like I stop three times a day and I 
Mm. ask God things with words or say things to God with words or listen to things from God with words, right? It has to go at Mm. some level deeper for it to be unceasing prayer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is above my pay grade too, but I, you know, I think it it's like in my own experience it's become really difficult to try and language this mystery of what does it feel like to feel as though you are caught up in God all the time. And the language that the, the word that I've kind of come to to feel about it is this language of beholding because it's almost this this way of living in which we live with God before us at all times, and it's not necessarily a mental exercise. You're right. It's almost this, it sits deep somehow. It's like, it's just a- allowing our lives to be seen by God and allowing ourselves to be seen by God and to live that way. And I think that's why how we live matters so much. What we do with our bodies matters so much in terms of Jesus' teaching. Um, what comes out of our mouths, what we allow into our eyes, all of that becomes not morality or legalism, um, but an, an act of fidelity, an act of intimacy. You know, I think about maybe marriage as an example or, you know, w- when you get married, you're saying no to a lot of things. You're saying no to every other man or woman on the planet, right? And there's this fidelity to that where what you do with your body no longer no not only matters to yourself, but to your spouse and, and beholding is this way of living like that with God. It's like my body is homed by God now. And what I do with that is prayer, how I live and, and engage in the world is prayer. And so it it moves beyond the mind into what I can consciously hold on to all the time and into this sort of God sees me and I see him and I'm learning to live my life kind of held in that way. Um, And even that language falls painfully short of trying to describe what I feel or what I imagine the saints mean by unceasing prayer and what I've experienced in my own life. Um, But maybe in its simplicity, it's just learning to receive God's loving and compassionate gaze toward us and then to just lovingly and compassionately gaze back at God all day, every day, every minute until we're in full glory. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus, I think, was talking about this, I could be wildly misreading him, but when I think of John 15, which is arguably the central text in Jesus' teachings on spiritual formation, Mm. on how the process by which we are formed into people who bear the fruit of the Spirit and become like Christ, even Jesus, brilliant as he was, resorted to metaphor. Or maybe that is mm. so my West, that, you know, that is so my Western bias that it's like he couldn't think of a good linear Greek philosophy essay to write. So he used a metaphor yeah. from <laughs> everyday life instead, as if the abstract concept is more real than the earthy metaphor. But, you know, Jesus used the metaphor of the branch in the vine and abiding. Mm. And that's not a cognitive metaphor. That's not a verbal metaphor. And that the branch is always in the vine and the vine is always in the branch. And at some point that dichotomy is meaningless because there's some point in that vine or tree where it's unclear where the branch ends and the vine begins and the Mm. vine ends and the branch begins. They are Mm. together. They are in union, you know? Mm. So yeah, at some point, you know, just words. And I I don't know, I want to get to a place in my relationship with the Trinity where words regularly fail me, where I, you know, where I just, I, I don't have language or even categories for how the Trinity is loving me you know, in Christ and by the spirit from the father. But, but you said this word beholding and that's beautiful language. You know, I think of that in Paul and of course, in some of my favorite streams of the church down through history, but Strana, how do we look at a God that we can't see? Like, I think I know what you're saying, but 
if, you know, if Paul's right and, you know, the, the language of contemplation comes from Paul, you know, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, as we with unfailed faces, beholding as in a mirror, contemplate the Lord's glory, there's those two words right next to each other, we are transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which mm-hmm. comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. I mean, it's initiated by God. We're transformed by God, not by us, by looking at him, looking at us in love. So, I mean, all of this is like that passage in my mind is ground zero for all mm. sorts of things. Mm. But how how do we behold, how do we gaze at, how do we look at a trinity that, that we can't see? Yeah. Uh, easy easy <laughs> question for you as you're just really putting me on the spot. In your home right? office. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me tell you. No. Um, in, in my defense, you have written a book on this. So yeah. you must have something to say. <laughs> yeah, there's... Yeah, fair enough. I mean, look, I think we behold God in lots of ways. We behold him by sitting in creation and noticing the rhythms and the sounds and feeling and saying this has come from the mind and heart of God. We behold God in scripture by reading his story and his language. We behold God um, in the church by participating in the community that is the literal physical body of Christ on earth. Um, we behold God when we stare into a baby's eye, a newborn baby's eyes, or you know, there's there's all of that. Um, but I think I think the primary thing for me, and I love what you said, man, is just so insightful and so profound about this needing to be in our bodies that we need to kind of move out of this understanding rationalization space into this body space. So for me, when I when I think of beholding God. I think of sitting and not trying to necessarily, you can't, I mean, I won't say you can't. I don't imagine you can see Trinity. You know, it doesn't make sense to me. And even Jesus said, no one's seen the Father, but if you've seen me, you know, there's this mystery of God, the unseeable, but yet seen in Christ. For me, it's about sitting down, slowing my body down, and just directing my heart. You know, St. Theophan the Recluse, this kind of, Russian starets or hermit uses this language of bringing the mind down into the heart um, and this sort of mystery of allowing your thoughts to come down into your body and sitting before God and saying, I'm here for you and expecting and trusting and believing that you're not receiving judgment or criticism and God doesn't have a magnifying glass. His, his His priority is not, I want to see all your sin and talk about it. But sitting and saying, God is a compassionate, empathetic, loving kindness. And that is pouring out toward me. And I'm going to sit and in my body, let my body see and experience and lean into that reality. And I don't know if on the other side of that you get to see something visually, but I think the seeing is the body accepting and recognizing the reality that God is astounding other love. And um, so for me, beholding is this practice of, okay, how do I not just look for God, but I look for this kind, loving, compassionate, empathetic God in the space of my body and my mind and in my life. Um, And then just kind of receiving that. Um, And that's as far as- For somebody- Yeah, man, that is gorgeous. For somebody who is hearing this and is like, I'm not Strawn who spent two years sick in a Franciscan monastery being taught by the spirit of Jesus to pray contemplatively. I like have three little kids or I'm a stockbroker and I have to be at the office at 6 a.m. At a very pragmatic level, like how, how do you do that with your body? Like, mm-hmm. like, and get as pragmatic as you want, like err on the side of, pragmatism over con- conceptual mm-hmm. nature, you know, mm-hmm. H- how do people begin to pray in this way? Well, for me, I mean, I got three young boys that whoever knows me will probably be laughing right now listening to this podcast because they are the most vivacious out there. Phys- My house is literally sounds like a hurricane every day. Um, <laughs> it, I receive great sympathy from my friends. So I don't live this kind of really still life in the way that I came into this was I used to get up, my second son used to wake up at about like three or four in the morning, 
for the day. And so I would be so tired. I would make a filtered coffee. I would sit in bed. My brain, you know, I was sick. I had brain fog and I would just sit in bed and I'd, the kids would be outside the door screaming. Often they'd come in with blood noses or whatever. Like that's that was the family. I would sit there and I would simply say, God, I'm exhausted, I'm tired, I can't see you, I can't feel you, but I know you're there and I'm going to sit here and just be with you. And that might last five minutes, it might last half an hour, my mind might go out all over the place, but training myself to to stay in that space of like, God, you're here and I'm going to sit here with you was really important. Um, I would say two other things that have been really massive for me has been learning to be in my body, which I realize sounds really happy to a lot of people, and I'm sure eyes are rolling right now. Um, but we live in a very disconnected age. We are a very disembodied people. We spend so much time on our phones, you know, pushing over our health. You know, we, we really live in a, a materialistic society. And so what I'll do is I'll sit, and but when I start to pray, I'll just sit and I'll just imagine, I'll let my thoughts run through my head. They'll run by almost imagine them like stars in the night, shooting stars in the night sky, just letting them move past. And then I just notice my body. I feel my chair where I'm connected with the chair, feet on the ground. I notice my breathing. And what I'm doing in that space is I'm coming into my present moment, getting out of my kid and my futuristic thoughts, my anxiety or anything. I'm coming into the present. And then I just say the word, I say Jesus. And then as I say Jesus' name, I imagine his presence, not filling just my mind, but entering into my arms and my legs and illuminating me and filling that space. And what that does for me is it helps bring me out of that moment. So that might just take a minute, might take 30 seconds. I might do it just as I park up somewhere. I might do it in the middle of a conversation where I'm talking to someone without them noticing. I might try and practice that for 10 minutes. Um, and then from that space, what I'll try and do is throughout the day is just say Jesus. I, if, as soon as I can remember it, I say Jesus' name and and try and invoke that same sensation of coming into awareness of the present, inviting the Holy Spirit into that space and just being like, he's here. And I do that when I'm doing the dishes or driving. Some days I forget to do it even once. Other days I do it a hundred times. I am no pro. But in all of those spaces, what I'm trying to do is just to stop um, and allow an awareness, a physical awareness of the Spirit within me to awaken and then to to let God be there, and that takes time. It doesn't. It took me years of practicing that to really sink it in. And that's the important thing with prayer for me. It is not a sprint. We will not become. We will not enter deep communion with God by going to a seminar or listening to this podcast and waking up in the morning and being amazing at it, or going through a, a four week practice that's over in a month. And we're like, cool, got yeah. it. Yeah, what the the mo- I reckon the greatest thing anyone can ever do is simply repeat Jesus' name as often as they can, and in days, weeks, months, and years, that invoking of His presence transforms us. And I think it's, it's often as simple as that, even though at the start it feels terrible. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have mixed feelings about the Jesus prayer tradition, but I love this idea of invocation. That was a new word for me, and you know, I don't like throw that one out when I'm chatting about the most recent Star Wars series or whatever, but to invoke Jesus' name, to call on Jesus' name, to invite Jesus' name, to claim at some kind of royal theological level the name of Jesus, you know, and recenter on it. Now, I mean, I love the reality of your life and little children as somebody with three kids, all teenagers now, which is just like a different end of the noise spectrum. You know, it's now it's electric guitars and sweet adolescent boys breaking things and okay. as they wrestle in their room or whatever. But um, that massive disclaimer, you know, at the top of the pile, still it does seem like silence at some level is essential to cultivating a deeper life with God. What are your thoughts on that? Of course, with all of the, just the real, the spiritual realism of life and urban and noise and family, but it does seem like learning to be in the body is partially about learning to quiet Mm. our environment Mm. Mm. or no. What would you say to that? 
Yeah, I mean, I do. I totally agree. Um, I think the way that I've come to see silence, I mean, I live, <laughs> I live a strange life. I'm an odd person. I have a little cabin by the beach. I literally sit in that cabin alone for my work hours for like 40 hours a week. And I'm normally too sick to, at night to have any social life. So in the town, I like, we moved here a few years, got no friends. I never go out. I literally just live in silence so much. So it feels unfair to talk about it. Um, but I think the thing that I've learned about silence is that just being silent does, isn't necessarily a spiritual practice the way we bring ourselves to it is. Um, and we can, we can try to practice silence in terms of the physical, not being around, say, listening to a podcast or music. Um, but the real work is done as we grow this inner silence and we bring ourselves to that space in, in a sort of rested innerness. And that actually, for me, is about lots of things. Um, I had this sort of experience once praying and saying, God, I, some days I can hear your voice really clearly and, and other days I can't. Why is that? And as I prayed, I sort of had this picture of this beautiful crystal lake and I could see right to the bottom and I felt God saying like, this is me, this is my voice, this is my accessibility. And then as I watched, I was throwing all the stuff in from like Netflix to podcast to Spotify to just social events and conversations. And as I did, it, it touched the bottom and all the sand kicked up and all the sediment came up. And God said, my voice is the same, but sometimes you overcrowd your life so much that you you can't hear me. You can't enjoy the waters of my of my love and of my voice. And for me, that was my first lesson in silence being like, Man, if I don't stop for a minute, and that for me that includes reading books, I can I can get on the book train pretty bad and fill up all my spare time reading books. And the silence that I need is an intellectual silence. I need to put those books down and just let God fill that space. Sometimes it's podcast listening podcasts while I'm doing the dishes or driving. Sometimes it's just that all of my prayer is talking to God and not receiving. Um and as I look at my life and sort of defrag the noise, all of that I see is noise. It's not sinful. I'm not saying it's sinful, but it is noise. And what I want to do is like push all of that noise as far to the periphery as I can to create an inner silence so that when I stop to do my silence in the morning or the evening or lunchtime, I'm able to bring my whole self to it without hitting like a brick wall at 100 miles per hour. So yes, I fully, man, the practice of silence, I think is crucial. I think our communities need it. I think our churches need to practice it. Um, but I think it has to come wrapped up in the sense of like, how am I denoising my life so that I'm not bringing this volume to silence every time I arrive to it, but I'm actually able to stop and say, God, let me be still before you and hear your voice and and receive what you have to offer. Strawn, what would you say to pastors? I know that you are not officially a pastor, though you are a servant of the local church and have been, you know, involved in church leadership for many years. But I've found some of our conversations around silence and the church over the last few years to be really helpful, in particular at the end of my tenure leading Bridgetown, you know, we were just beginning to experiment with some things that nobody would know, but were based on text message exchanges that you and I have had yeah. around, you know, I think what you call noise refugees and mm -hmm. realizing that, you know, I think I've come to believe that one of the primary roles of a pastor in our modern era is to help people unbusy their lives and slow down and quiet down to experience God in the warp and woof of everyday life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I've been thinking a lot about the way that the church model that I've been a part of, and this is not self-flagellation or, you know, others' criticism. It just is an observation. The church model that I have been around my whole life often does more to add noise into people's lives than to subtract it. So do you have any thoughts on, and I think I know there's different moments, you know, a lot of the church model that we're living through with a high emphasis on uh, music and activity and activism comes out of the 70s, 80s and 90s and is arguably a response to kind of legalism and lethargy in the church. Mm. And so there's this attempt to kind of like, in, you know, infuse life into the church. But now we're in such a different cultural moment where the problem is 
chronic burnout, distraction, exhaustion, you know, high, high level of anxiety, mental health, all of this. And so I almost wonder if we're, we're using an old emphasis and it's not right or wrong. It's just, again, it's back to what you said, it's about emphasis. So mm. what would you say to, to pastors who are serving churches right now and trying to cultivate a culture, you know, um, in their church that is conducive to life with God. Just any thoughts on church and silence and noise refugees? Well, I mean, I, yeah, what you're saying is I so hear that, man. I'm so in agreement. I, I wonder if, you know, when I was coming up in the nineties, um, oh, can't believe I just said that. Um, you know, and uh, the biggest. I, know. I keep using that disclaimer lately. Like, I know I'm dating myself, trying to think that people would be like, "Oh no, he's still cool. He's young. He knows that he's old." But the reality is that uh, I'm not. They're they're increasingly looking at me with like glazed eyes. Like, wait, yeah. you, you're you had a life before an iPhone? What? Yeah. What? <laughs> um, but yeah, back back then, the you know we used to talk a lot about apathy. You know, apathy is our biggest problem. We're always fighting apathy and. When you're fighting apathy, what you want is to create a space on Sundays that energizes people, you know, where people come and they come a little bit, you know, they got their nice job and their family or whatever. And I'm not I'm not saying that this is true across the board because a lot of people were struggling in the 90s too. Um, but this sort of Western kind of Christian idea of, of apathy. And so we created these concerts. And I know this has been a long time, but church has really been a concert. And, um, you know, I gained heaps from that. So that's, this is not a knock at all. You know, and I'm a musician, so I know all about running concerts. I love them. But I think what's happened is we've had this big shift. You know, the world is a complex place. We know this. The last couple of years have been t- taxing and hard. But if we're honest with ourselves, that shift started a lot longer ago than 2020. You know, we started running out of gas in the sort of 2008 through on through and and I think what's happened is we've got people coming to church exhausted, overwhelmed. They've got a thousand voices in their ears. It's loud in urban environments, all of this stuff. They're coming to church on Sundays and we're still giving them a concert and wanting to lift them up uh, to, to sort of in, in ask them for a greater energy spend. And just just like you said, I don't think that's necessarily because it's a bad model or it's wrong, but I think... I think there's an invitation there to reconsider what would it be like if we saw instead of people coming to us apathetic, um, what if they're coming as refugees of an exhausting, noisy, opinionated world and missionally thinking, what do they need? Um, Most people in my experience, in, in my own realms of prayer, most people at church have no idea how to pray or they don't pray. And so they come on a Sunday really tired, exhausted, probably stressed and anxious and even just having a moment for someone to say, we're just going to take five minutes. We're going to lead you through a prayer. We're going to meditate on the scripture. We're just going to still ourselves before the presence of God. That's not anti-charismatic. I think that's charismatic. And then no, it's thoroughly charismatic. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess to, to look at people with compassion and say, maybe they're not wanting to serve or maybe they're not giving as much or doing these things, not because they're self-oriented, but because they are exhausted, exhausted by a world that is demanding a lot from them, that is stressing them out with difficult economic situations. And what if we move from a concert model to another kind of model? And I don't know what that is. You know, I often think about the metaphor of cathedral, not because I fully endorse cathedrals and all of the things that come along with it um, or that it's a perfect idea, but that a cathedral is a space of, of presence and of beauty. Um, and, you know, if you think about the architecture, um, it's a place where you come to rest, where the communion table is at the center. Um, what does it look like to reorient church experience around providing rest and quietness and humility? Um, and what if the church isn't just another place where there's lots of opinion and lots of demand on our opinions, but is actually a place of restedness, of silence, of question asking and of space and, I don't think that has to look a certain style of way. I don't think, you know, there's no sort of format, but I think just... Yeah, that doesn't mean you you need to go high church, Anglican, and burn incense and wear robes. No. no it's it's just creating, curating spaces of quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing wrong with robes, by the way, but... Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't you think know, I could do it. I'm not, I'm not cool enough, not sophisticated enough. I mean, I've been going to like a... The church I go to here in this town is an Anglican, sort of high Anglican. There's lots of people over 70. It's probably, we're the only people under 70, I think, who go. It's like 20 people. 
and I miss and long for so much of the charismatic sort of stuff of, of my previous vineyard church that I was working at. And, but I also love that on a Sunday morning I go there and my soul distills, there's space, and there's an opportunity to just exhale. And often I don't realize how little I've done it until I turn up and someone else is asking me to slow down on their time. And I'm like, wow, okay, Jesus, I'm, I'm present, I'm awakening, I'm here. And so what does it look like to kind of even ask the question, what if the concert model or the theater model isn't the only model? And if it's not, how do we re, re kind of redo that in our time and place for it? these noise refugees in the world that I think are just in desperate need. You know, this morning I finished reading a book, a secular book by a journalist from Men's Health. That was kind of a rewilding the world kind of, you know, get out into nature kind of book. Mm -hmm. But he had a whole section on silence and a bunch of data that I wasn't familiar with. And he was writing about how in every other area of our life, um, the modern world has lowered sensory input so, for example, we have um, HVAC, we'd call it heating and air conditioning. So our body doesn't have to adjust to extreme temperatures like it used to. Mm. And we have soft beds that we sleep on. So our body doesn't have to adjust to a hard or rocky ground to sleep on at night. Mm. With the exception of sound, and there's all this data that basically says the world is at least four times louder than it has been for tens of thousands of years in modern history. And uh, he had all this fascinating like neurobiological kind of data on how the human brain either evolved or grew or however, whatever your opinion is, to interpret loud noises as threats. So in a pre-modern, pre-industrial technological world, if you're out in nature, there's constant noise. Like nature is actually quiet and noisy at the same time. But if you hear something loud, it is likely something dangerous. Not necessarily, but the odds are very high. Loud in nature is, is a threat. And so the brain is still wired to interpret noise above a certain decibel range as a threat. And so living in a city, living in a world, driving your car down the freeway to work, your body, even if your mind doesn't you know, think of it that way, mm. is in fight or flight just because of the noise that you're in. Mm. And there's all this data around this now. And so wow. I thought, man, if that's the world we live in, and so much of prayer is about learning to be safe in the love of God, then surely quiet must play some kind of a role in the future of the church, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Oh, dude, I love that. It actually helps to make a lot of sense for me because uh, in just before COVID hit, we moved out of a city. So we've been living in the city in Auckland and New Zealand. Yeah, when I met you, you were right in the urban core of Auckland. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. And I was traveling, you know, to the States three or four times a year to to do shows and recording and then working at a church that was like 400 sort of young adults in this urban environment. And we moved down to this small town of about 2,000 people in rural new sort of beach beachside rural New Zealand. And it was really shocking for my system. It was like, overwhelmingly slow i mean it's pitch black here at night there's no social life i was like i got so bored and so overwhelmed like i was still it was like i was a coke addict to noise and and stimulation it was like an addict to those things i came down here and it was like going dry and one day i was like praying and i was like god i am so bored here you know there's like no shows there's nothing to do <laughs> Yeah, like, it wasn't like utopian, like, ah, it was boring. Yeah, I wish I could say I just grew a beard and started fishing and catching fish, but, you know, I didn't. I just fed the fish. Um, and I felt God saying to me in response, he was like, Strawn, life isn't boring. You are boring. And I was, and it was, you know, classic God speaking to me. I'm pretty thick, so he, he's pretty straight. But what I realized is that an urban environment, I think we don't realize how deeply formed we are by urbanization, even if we don't live in the city, because most of the sort of art or the theology or whatever that we listen to and receive comes from people in urban centers. And it is very urbanized sort of energy, very urbanized thinking. Um, and I think what I realized is in a city, you are 
constantly trying to keep people up, right? Cafes, music, you're trying to keep the noise level at a persistent level to be energized. It's like you build cities so that you can protect yourselves against the seasons. You kind of have these luminous lights so that you're not bound by time anymore. You know, you've got gyms that are 24-7. The whole idea is that we can overcome the natural rhythms of life. But in a rural environment where there's none of that, you can't maintain that high level of energy. You have to sink down into the energy of creation or the, the rhythm of creation. So you have to slow down. And you can't apply an urban expectation to a rural life. You have to allow yourself to learn to listen to the waves, to pay attention and contemplate the the, the sea and the birds and the, and the thing. And I, I came to see this as an image for prayer and spirituality in the sense that like, if we create church environments that are constantly trying to lift people up, then we're always having to go up and up and up. We're saying we kind of reach God, we reach energy by pushing up into it. We've got to maintain, we've got to sustain this energy, which is quite an urbanized way of thinking about it. But what if prayer and God is actually about sinking further down? It's about removing some of the noise. It's about coming down into reality, which is much slower, much calmer much more peaceful and that there God's voice rises to the surface because it's in its right context. Um, and I think there's something in this moment for us of like, how do we shift from expecting God to be up here all the time to actually humbling ourselves and drawing ourselves down into God to hear his voice at the level and volume he's speaking at, which is much more natural, but we are so dislocated and disconnected from it. All of that is a foreign concept to many of us. And it's taken me, I've been down here almost three years and I feel like I'm only just detoxifying and understanding personally what that means for me. Wow. You know what I'm thinking of right now, Strawn, a number of years ago, I uh, was in a major US city and I went to visit and attend church at a very famous church uh, that was um, pastored by a very famous young pastor that I will not name. And it was just like a two hour, I mean, it was a concert, 110%, but it was an emotional experience. I mean, just watching him preach, he was an extraordinary preacher. And the amount of just energy that went into that sermon and that worship experience and that church service was, I mean, it was extraordinary. It was like, you know, no different than watching pick your favorite band of choice or whatever, just that kind of leaving everything on the stage. Yeah, yeah. But I just remember thinking, what does that look like when he's 72 years old? Mm. Why, what does that look like when he's 42 years old? You know, mm. like mm. H- how is that? Sust- I don't know. I mean, intermittent fasting, workout, keto, whatever, <laughs> essential oils, do all the things. But ha- that, that seems so exhausting to me to try to keep the I think momentum is the the mega church word that the energy of the church kind of trending up and to the right. Mm. It feels like it's it's only a matter of time until that that will not work. And again, I'm not against emotion and joy and celebration mm. and all of that stuff's beautiful, but there is there is another path that I think not a lot of Christians and pastors in the Protestant stream of the church realize is available. You know, I'm thinking mm-hmm. of Eugene Peterson's translation of the Psalms, step out of the traffic and know that I am God is Love his that. translation of be still, you know, yeah. step out of the traffic, get out yeah. of the noise, get to the quiet and know that I am God. But you're also talking strong about hearing God's voice. And that's one of the things I love about you and love about this whatever the stream is that we're, that we're swimming in or floating in, you know, you're not just talking about still the body, breathe, you know, say the name of Jesus over and over and over again. You're talking about at some level, hearing the voice of God for yourself, you know, call that listening prayer and for others call that the prophetic or whatever. Mm-hmm. Can, can you kind of maybe expand and give us your thoughts on, When you're, whether you're in a large group uh, with noise or by yourself in the quiet, a a type of prayer that is less talking to and more listening to God or Mm -hmm. even hearing from God for yourself or on behalf of others? Yeah, I guess there's a lot of ways to approach 
um, hearing God and, and everyone's so different. I know for me, it sort of arrives to me in different forms in different seasons in my life. But I think when I think about listening prayer, I think about something very, you know, I, I kind of start that posture similarly to what I described earlier in, in the sense of like, just taking a moment to stop and settle down, to settle my mind, to just come into the present, to come into my body and awareness. And the reason I keep saying my body awareness is because I have such a high value of my body as a temple of the spirit, you know, that New Testament theology. So it matters to be aware of it. And then to kind of look to God in my heart and just to say, I'm here. And my my way of sort of opening that space is I just say, God, would you share your heart with me today? Would you would you speak to me about what you care about, what you're thinking about? Um, and often in that space, for me, what kind of comes up at least is more this almost movement of my own heart. It's like this sudden gravitas towards somebody or something. And I'm quite a visual person. I'm an artist and I think in pictures. So that usually ends up forming into some kind of a picture for me. Um, but the sense is more that like, I don't know, you know, when you're, when you're with somebody and they're grieving or they're celebrating one or the other. And it's like this moment where suddenly you are grieving with them or you are celebrating with them and it overtakes you. It's just this feeling of like you cry with them or you laugh with them. You're like, oh my gosh, I am so happy for you. You know, um, I see it in that sense that there's this, this can be this moment where what God is feeling suddenly becomes what we're feeling or his joy or his grief. Um, and he might sort of direct that towards someone. So for me, it's not like words. So I was drawn this, 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 or not even always a vision, but it's the sense of God is saying, you want to know where I'm at. I love you. And I, you know, you're my friend. I'm going to share where I'm at. And I just, you might feel that sense of God. Um, and that, that's a participation. That's that communion. And so I think listening to God for me is about how do I feel what you feel and empathize with you. Um, but probably one of the other ways that primarily in my life that um, is has been a place of growth for God's voice is prayer journaling. I just prayer journal every morning, Father, what's on your heart? And someone once told me many, 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 many years ago um, to just start with good morning, Father. And then, you know, sometimes I might write good morning, son, or whatever, and just write whatever comes and not to over criticize it in the moment, just to let it be, you know, you can critique it later and, and take it to scripture and community and work it out, but just to practice writing. And I, I started doing that moons ago. And that has been for me an absolute life source of learning to hear God's voice. And I vividly remember the first time I did it. Good morning, Father. And I fully expected him to say, oh, finally, Strom, we got to talk about this issue. We got to. And I was like, I was so afraid to do it because I was genuinely afraid of what God was going to say. And, you know, the first thing he said was, Strawn, you don't even know how much I love you. And I just wept. I was just like, that can't be God. He couldn't possibly say that. But I knew it was him because it was so outside of my paradigm. And so I think those two things, those two forms of prayer have been really important to me over the years. Isn't it a miracle that the Spirit of Christ has direct access to our mind and imagination, that he's yeah. closer to us than we are to ourself. You know, sometimes we feel like, am I just, is this just all in my head? And the reality is our whole life is in our head. Everything yeah. is in our head. We experience the world through our head and through our body. And, but it's just stunning to me that the Trinity would make their home in us and would even lovingly insert their voice into our consciousness and the flow of mm -hmm. thoughts and feelings and desires through our mind stream. For those of you listening, you know, um, Strawn, what would you recommend? I, I still find Willard's book, Hearing God's Voice, to be the most helpful and theologically kind of grounded book on discerning the voice of God. Pete Gregg has a new one out, How to Hear God, that's really good and more a little bit more accessible. Anything else that you'd recommend for people, uh, whether it's a book or a course or on kind of learning because i know for a lot of people that is a brand new idea what you're saying in prayer i quiet myself and i open my mind or even my body and i hear from god you know right. and of course that raises about eight thousand questions yeah. you know 
So for somebody that wants to go deeper into that, anything you'd recommend? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, um, I guess so much of the way that I came to it was just through years and years of experience and, and participating in prayer groups. And um, I'm not necessarily suggesting that because, you know, I made lots of mistakes and, and, you know, misunderstood a lot of things along the way. I mean, I think I haven't um, read all of Pete Gregg's book, but I've, you know, he's just, he's really good at explaining it really clearly. And his, I've loved his books. Um, I think for, uh, for somebody who's wanting to experience it, I think the best thing possible would be to try and get around a, a group of praying people and to just participate in it because it's very difficult to understand intellectually. And it's taken me a lot of my life to even try and find language for how I experience God's voice. But I think that we are far too afraid of getting it wrong. I think most people don't kind of start practicing hearing God's voice or sharing his voice because they feel like if they do it wrong, the world's going to end. And I just think get around a couple of people with a similar heart and say, let's get together and just practice hearing God's voice. He is big enough. Trust me, he's big enough for your mistakes. I have made mistakes that would make you squirm and still make me squirm. And somehow the world has kept going. God's love has still filled me and it's okay. So honestly, I think the best thing to do, get together with people and just pray and say, Father, would you speak? And allow the Holy Spirit to teach you if you can work it out with a pastor or an experienced person, even better. Read Pete Gregg's book, you know, read his, get your hands on that kind of stuff. But ultimately, it will be the Holy Spirit that teaches it because it is a very strange thing to learn. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about hearing God's voice, right? Um, and it's, it's that's mystery. So I don't know if that's very helpful. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's really helpful. I mean, gosh, yeah, because in, in in moving people toward silence, we are not attempting to move people away from community. I think most yeah. Christians in the modern West need to go deeper into solitude and deeper into community. And a lot of us live in like the worst of both worlds in this middle, like noisy social setting. Yeah. It isn't bad, but yeah. I experience God most deeply in silence and solitude and in deep webbing of relationships, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, are the two places I, I seem to find God most and hear God's voice most coming to me, you know, this early, early this morning in quiet prayer. And then last night sitting around our fire pit with a mentor to me who just was, it was like God's voice coming to me through him, you know? Mm -hmm. So, all right. Beautiful, last question, because there is this thing called the clock and I need to respect your time. <laughs> last question. I promise. What does intercession look like in this kind of heart posture of spirituality, you know, it's sad. I think a lot of people that kind of move into the contemplative space or become passionate about silence or, you know, resting in God often kind of move away from, or even give up entirely on asking God for anything or, uh, you know, what, what Pentecostals would call contending, you know, contending prayer, like the Moses kind of arguing with God to bend, you know, God's will toward good or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So um, what, what does intercession look like from this kind of a life posture? I'm, you know, I'm figuring this one out because I feel Man, I just feel like such a child. I've got so much to learn, you know, and my journey from, you know, this, it was hard because I went from literally three, four, just so many years of intense intercessory stuff into total isolation. And, you know, so I'm a bit of an extreme case, but I think the biggest things that I've learned through this sort of addition of, of a contemplative way of life is that intercession has become for me far more a participation in God's heart. And I think at the, at the essence, if contemplation or about prayer is union with God, if we're doing it right, we will begin to be grieved about things in the world and in others' lives naturally. So as we become more like God by being with him, we're not going to be able to talk to a friend who's going through something and just go home and have dinner. It's gonna, it's gonna sit in our bellies. Um, and intercession in many ways is often the spirit within us praying through us. So I think, I think again, it's a yes. Yes, God, to your grief. Yes, God, to your anger over this injustice. Yes, God, to um, your desire for healing. 
And I think that that doesn't necessarily have to mean, you know, in the early days for me, I might get in a room and speak in tongues for a couple hours or I might stay out weeping or whatever. Yes to those things as well, but also it can actually just be a quiet, allowing God to sit heavy in our bellies and to do the work of carrying with us. So I think there is a bit of a mystery there. But the innocence for me is like we just have to, with always with prayer, and I've, I've been so, God has had to teach me this so many times, is always have to come back to the scriptures and what is Je- who, who is Jesus and what did he say? He said, you know, ask, seek, and knock. And whatever you think about whatever your th- theology or critical theory of development or all of that kind of stuff in the spiritual life, I don't think we ever get beyond that command. Who, who can ever say, I'm so mature that I don't have to obey Jesus' teaching, you know? Well, because we never mature beyond needing help. Yeah. N- yeah. None of us mature beyond needing help from outside ourselves. Yes. Yes. And it was enough for Jesus to stay up all night praying and interceding for us. It must be enough for us. So... I think that the way that I come to intercession is just simply, as I grow nearer to God, a sign that I am truly contemplating God and not something else is that desire for praying for others and for the world rises up more and more within me, that I become so deeply unsettled by suffering and grief and trials that I pray for others more regularly. But it often looks far more like a carrying God and a lightness and less like a feeling I have to say it enough times or say it loudly enough as sort of go, as I come into this awareness of God in my body. So the nature of the intercession, I think, changes as we mature and grow. But the desire and the desperate need to do it should never change um, because that's who Jesus is. He's in heaven right now interceding for you and I. Like he's That's what he's doing. He's interceding for the church. So we can't be in him and not participate in that same thing. Strawn, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. Thank you for your fidelity to Jesus through many long years of suffering that have formed and forged you into an old soul and have created a depth in you with God that is an extraordinary gift to be in the room with or over the internet, FaceTime link with. So let's Thanks, end man. with uh, one of your songs. Uh, again, you, you are a musician and a recording artist. This is a song that my wife and I love called Feel the Night. So maybe as you listen to this, as we end this podcast interview, maybe just whatever is sticking out to you from Strawn and I's conversation, just hold that before, offer it up to God, and let prayer be something that you do, but also that God does in and through you. Here's Feel the Night. For years I've stood, I've held the light. Spoke into the night and fought for the devouring lion. The peace I know has held me in. As a father draws close with an army to begin. Thank you.
The dark before the dawn feels fierce and it feels close. But may you hear the angel's voice. He said, Hold on one more hour to be with you, boy. So I So I will